Hi there. Come on in. It's time for Old Time Radio. I'm your host, Jerry Sharp, inviting you to pull up a chair and listen with me to some old-time radio shows. I've got the old Majestic Radio all warmed up. We're going to reach out into that ether and listen to some comedy, adventure, and drama on old-time radio. And on today's show, we're going to hear Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. Last week, we heard episode one. This week, episode two. And this is a broadcast from October 8th of 1940. And then we'll hear Fibber McGee and Molly. This is a broadcast from January 6th, 1948. <laughs> You know, in those early radio years, Jack Armstrong went to school at Hudson High in the town of Hudson, USA. And his best friends, Billy and Betty Fairfield, were fellow students at Hudson. And their five-day-a-week adventures revolved around the football field and the basketball court. And for a short time, there was even a sixth episode on Saturday consisting of nothing but a fictional ball game of some sort. The dialogue went something like, Hey, Billy, I'm in the clear. Throw me the ball. Here it is, Jack. And here it goes. Hooray, hooray. Hudson High has won again. Well, sensing the limitation in dramatic possibilities, the Saturday games were discontinued. And inevitably, Jack came in contact with crime and criminals. And that's like the show that we're listening to right now. We're on episode two, a broadcast from October 8, 1940. Franklin McCormick, the announcer, will fill you in on details if you missed last week's adventure. Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Wave the flag for Hudson High, boys. Show them how we stand. Never shall our team be champions, known throughout the land. Wheaties, breakfast of champions, bring you the thrilling adventures of Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Yeah? Who's there? Oh, you know who it is. I thought we were going to take the old football over to the lot this morning and practice kicking. Oh, hi, Eddie. Come on and wait till I finish my breakfast. I'll be with you in just a sec. Watch eating. Looks pretty good to me. That's a breakfast of champions. You know, the dish so many champion athletes eat in the morning. It's a training breakfast. You mean you're eating a special kind of breakfast because you're in training for football? Gee, pretty fancy. What's in the big orange package there? That's Wheaties. You gotta have Wheaties for a genuine breakfast of champions. And believe me, they're plenty good. Say, do you want to try a bowl full? Yeah, I don't mind. See, you fix the Wheaties with lots of milk. And then you slice some fruit on top. Here's a banana for yours. How come Wheaties are so good for athletes? Well, because they're whole wheat for one thing. The coach says whole wheat is mighty nourishing because it's rich in food energy. And that's what athletes need to help them keep on the go. Boy, those Wheaties are good. They've got a taste that sure hits the spot. Well, it's about time you learned about a breakfast of champions. See, if you like Wheaties, why don't you get in training and eat them every morning, too? You know, this breakfast of champions is part of the three training rules of Jack Armstrong. Say, that's right. Jim Bennett was telling me about those rules just the other day. Let's see. You start by getting lots of fresh air, sleep, and exercise, don't you? That's right. Then you use plenty of soap and water every day. And for rule three, you eat a breakfast of champions every morning. <laughs> that's all there is to it. Well, past the Wheaties, you and I are both in training. Yes, sir, fellas and girls, it's just that easy to get started on the three famous training rules of Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. 
It's a system that's okayed for young athletes by famous coaches like Wallace Wade of Duke and Bernie Berman of Minnesota. And now that you know the rules, you'd better get yourself a big supply of those nourishing whole wheat flakes with the champion flavor, Wheaties. And now Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Jack and Billy are carefully climbing aboard Uncle Jim's two-masted schooner Spindrift anchored in San Francisco Harbor. There's a mysterious stranger on board, and they want to find out what he's up to. Uncle Jim and Betty have just left Uncle Jim's big amphibian plane and are on their way to prepare the Spindrift for the cruise to the Sulu Sea in search of the precious uranium metal which lies somewhere on a wrecked yacht. But there are other people interested in finding that uranium. Desperate members of an organized gang. And Uncle Jim has sent Jack and Billy ahead to find out what this strange visitor is doing on the boat. Listen. Careful, Billy. Take hold of the shrouds this way and pull yourself up. I'd rather use the side rail, Jack. There. See how quietly I got on deck? That's the idea. There. Well, we're aboard, and I'll bet he didn't hear a thing. What do we do now? We've got to find out where he is on the boat. You go forward, and I'll go aft just as quietly as we can. And the first one to hear him below signals the other. Okay, Jack. But we've got to be careful he doesn't hear us first. Here goes. <laughs> Quiet, Billy. Gosh. Oh, you sure did it up brown. I know. Gosh, Father Neptune could have heard that way down in Davy Jones' locker. Somebody's coming up from below. Pretend we've just come aboard naturally. <laughs> well, Billy... Can't you keep your feet out of those coils? <laughs> Guess I can't, Jack. Well, don't fall into one head first or you'll hang yourself. Hello there, Below. Who's aboard? He's coming up from the air, Kevin. Hello. Why doesn't he say something instead of giving us that oily smile with those big teeth? I said hello. So sorry. I did not expect you. You didn't expect us? That rather squares us up. We didn't expect you on the boat either. I should say I did not expect you so soon. You are Jack Armstrong, are you not? Jack, he knows you. And your friend is Billy Fairfield. Well, well, he knows me too. You came from Hudson in that magnificent airplane that just passed overhead. I saw it land by the yacht club. I did not expect you would get to this ship so soon. We did rather hurry, didn't we? Ask him what business that is of his, Jack. I don't like his face anyway. You saw me, perhaps, as you flew overhead and hurried to the boat. It seems to me we've been answering all the questions. Who are you, anyway? My name does not matter. I am only a humble personage. Humble or not, you seem to know all about us. You honor me. I know so very little. You seem to know more about us than we do about you. What else do you know? I know that Captain Fairfield and his niece, Betty, were also on that magnificent plane. Well, suppose we start knowing a few things about you. For instance, what are you doing on our boat? Watch him, Jack. He's looking at your hands. He's up to something. That's right. Why are you looking at my hands so hard? So sorry. Such nice hands. I was admiring them. Well, I'll... if I didn't have my hands in my pockets, I'll bet he... Hey, hey! Hey, why are you coming toward me? Oh, very sorry. Your hands. Perhaps you will kindly oblige and let me see that. Oh, I'll say I won't. Why should I let you see my hands? Keep away. Oh, oh, oh. See? Oh. It is so very simple to remove hands from pockets why, of a why, reluctant he, 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 person. He jiu-jitsued me, Jack. He jiu-jitsued me. See here, Mr. Whoever you are. This has gone far enough. We find you on our boat. You won't answer our questions. And you're acting mighty queer. Now, I want to know what you're doing here. So very sorry. It is not perhaps your boat after all. So sorry to say so, but it was only chartered to your Uncle Jim. Your humble servant is interested in buying and came aboard to inspect. So sorry to upset you. Maybe you do want to buy the boat, or maybe you're interested in it for other reasons. But do you want to buy our hands, too? That's telling them, Jack. Let's see them wriggle out of that. They are nice hands, but no, I do not wish to buy. You must pardon me. A peculiar hobby of mine, admiring hands. And now, if you please, I shall take my unworthy self from your boat. I find I do not, after all, wish to buy it. 
You will excuse me if I leave? I think you'll stay here for a while. So, you have been pleased to relieve my boat of its oars. An excellent joke. Truly an excellent joke. I shall have many a chuckle over it later. Maybe you will, later, but not now. No? So sorry, but I see an excellent pair of oars lashed to the deck here. I shall use those. Oh, no, you don't. I think I do. My unworthy self may boast, perhaps, but removing hands from pocket is least of my accomplishments. Easy there, Billy. No force. Remember Uncle Jim's orders. How oh. wise of Uncle Jim. Truly a man whose intelligence is as the noonday sun. But is not that your Uncle Jim rowing out now? Yes, it is. Then I shall wait. Jump on Jiminy, Jack. He wants to see Uncle Jim. Throw me that line, Billy, and I'll stand by when Uncle Jim pulls alongside. Hi, Uncle Jim. Stand by to catch a line. Okay, Jack. All fast, Uncle Jim. You got here just in time. Well, well. See, we have a visitor aboard. Gangway for a heavyweight. It'll be good to set foot on deck again with the mast and spars reaching to the sky. Gosh, you came just in time, Uncle Jim. Introduce me to our visitor, Jack. Sorry, Uncle Jim, but he wouldn't give me his name. So sorry. Name of such a humble personage is seldom important. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Someday we might want to return your call. You do me too much honor. But, uh, Jack, what can we do for him? He says he was interested in buying the spindrift and that the owner let him come aboard to inspect. Hmm, that's odd. The owner didn't tell me he planned to sell. Do not be distressed. He does not plan to sell until you return. Jack, watch him. See how he's looking at Uncle Jim's hands. Just like he looked at ours. Gives me the creeps. Have you seen enough of the boat, or would you care to inspect her again? You are too kind. My departure for shore was delayed by the removal of the oars from my boat by Jack Armstrong and your esteemed nephew. <laughs> Why, what a thing to do. I shall insist on Jack rowing you back to make amends. Billy can row in for Jack later. <laughs> so sorry, but my humble self cannot permit such kindness. Mm, as you like. Jack, you go in anyway. Go to the branch post office and pick up a package for me. Package, Uncle Jim? What is it? Mm, just some kind of knick-knack or other that came from the Philippines. It was forwarded from Hudson. I found the registry slip in my mail waiting for me here. It's in this pocket, I think. Yes, here it is. Yeah. Look out, Uncle Jim. Here you. Give me back that slip. Stop. Stand where you are. Most unfortunate if this gun should go off. You will kindly stay on this boat, yes? See, I cut loose two skiffs, and I will take yours. So sorry to inconvenience you. Uncle Jim, we're not going to stand here and see him get away with that. Why, that package might be terribly important. Stay where you are, Billy. But if we all rush him at Do once... Do as I, I tell you, Jack. Truly, your Uncle Jim has the wisdom of the ages. So sorry, but my humble self must leave. So sorry you must remain. But water is deep. And the tide is sweet. So nice to have met you. Goodbye. Uncle Jim, do we have to let him get away with this? Yes, Billy, I'm afraid we do. But what could he want with... I'll come to that later, Jack. He's gone now. Look at him roll. Wonderful hidden muscle. Now tell me what you found out about him. Nothing. Less than nothing. You see, we got aboard quietly enough, but once on deck, we stumbled. You mean, Jack, that I stumbled? Clumsy ox that I was. Well, anyway, he was below and heard us. He came on deck at once, wouldn't give his name, and said he was inspecting the boat with an eye to buying her. And that wasn't true, of course. We know that now. I guess we both suspected it then, Uncle Jim. Is that all? No, Uncle Jim, there's something else. Sounds too ridiculous. He was terribly interested in Jack's hands, and then in mine. I'll say. He pulled a jujitsu on Billy to get his hands out of his pockets. But that isn't all, Uncle Jim. I noticed when you came aboard that the first thing he did was to look at your hands just as though he was looking for something. I think he was looking for something, Billy. On the boat, Uncle Jim? I don't know what he wanted on the boat. We'll find that out later. But I think I know what he was looking for on your hands and mine. But there's only one thing he could be looking for on our hands. A ring. A ring? Jack's right, Billy. He was looking for a ring. 
I don't understand. Remember what? that token we were to get from Professor Loring? I don't know what... I didn't know what it would be until you told me about our friend looking at your hands. It must have been a ring, a remarkable ring of some kind. And they knew that Professor Loring may have managed to send it to us. Then that package at the post office, that must be the ring. And we let him get away with it. <laughs> don't worry about that. Our oily friend is smart, but he hasn't had the last laugh yet. You mean that registry slip was a fake? Nothing else. Ever since I learned that I might get an important token from Professor Loring, I've suspected this gang would be after it. I pulled an old receipt out of my pocket just to see how our friend would react. And how he did react. I'd give a pretty penny to see his face when he gets ashore and reads that receipt. He'll be oh so sorry, so very sorry. But Jack, Billy, don't forget that we may get that package any day now. And if we do, remember that some of the best and most unscrupulous brains of the world will be after it. That is something to remember. And now that we know how desperate they we are... Don't we don't know the half of it yet, Jack. And now let's unship the Spindrift's little boat and go after those two skiffs. There's work ahead of us, and maybe a lot more danger than we realize. Well, what a surprise our foreign friend will have when he looks at that slippy stool. But come to think of it, what was he doing on the boat in the first place? There's a lot more going on just now than anyone knows. That uranium must be just as important as Uncle Jim says it is. And say, was our friend really looking for a ring? There's something behind that, but what? So listen in, all of you, at the same time tomorrow for another thrilling episode with Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. You know, the fellows and girls who eat Wheaties for breakfast are getting lots of fun you should be having, too. Those Wheaties flakes pack a swell flavor, a zippy come-and-get-it flavor that you ought to go for in a great big way. That's why you want to be sure to get genuine Wheaties. W-H-E-A-T-I-E-S. Have you tried Wheaties? They're whole wheat with all of the bran. Won't you try Wheaties? For Wheaties this is Franklin McCormick saying goodbye until tomorrow for General Mills, makers of Wheaties, Breakfast of Champions, who have just presented another episode of Jack Armstrong... The All-American Boy. Breakfast food in the land. Wave the Piper Hudson High, boy. And remember, old-time radio fans, that next week at the same time, you'll be able to hear Episode 3. Now, the broadcast that you heard today was from October 8, 1940. Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. And over, in future weeks, we'll be hearing programs like Superman... Superman shows. and We have a number of them all set up. That'll be following our Jack Armstrong segments. Well, last week we started telling you about our first commercially licensed radio station, KDKA, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Dr. Frank Conrad, who was our first official announcer on commercial radio, on our first commercially licensed station. Well, KDKA submitted their application for a license on October 16th, 1920. And election night was then only a little more than two weeks away, and so that was selected for the grand opening. KDKA went on the air with the world's first regularly scheduled broadcast, the Harding-Cox election returns on November 2nd in 1920. Now here's a Westinghouse story describing the event. The returns were received by telephone from a Pittsburgh newspaper and were then sent out by wireless telephone. And so rapid was the service obtained by this method that the receiving operators were able to get the returns exceedingly fast. In some cases, they were heard even before they were received by special telegraph wires. During the intervals between returns, phonograph music was played and those amateurs having loud sounding horns or two-stage amplifiers were able to throw the music over large rooms. Also two banjo artists were present and rendered very good banjo selections. And not only in Pittsburgh were the returns heard, but in many towns in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, the messages were heard with equal clearness. And now, my radio friends, stand by, because... 
We're going to the Café Rouge of the Hotel Pennsylvania in New York City and Glenn Gray and the Casaloma Orchestra. Columbia presents Glenn Gray and the Casaloma Orchestra. <laughs> From the Café Rouge in the Hotel Pennsylvania, New York City, Columbia brings you the favorites of millions, Glenn Gray and the Casaloma Orchestra, featuring the voices of Skip Nelson and Fats Daniels. Now a very definitive ditty in the style of that happy fellow Fats Daniels. It's got to be this or that. Glenn Gray and the Casaloma Orchestra. This was a broadcast during wartime. We don't have an exact date on this broadcast. And Glenn was broadcasting along with his Casaloma Orchestra from the Café Rouge of the Hotel Pennsylvania in New York City. And each week on Old Time Radio, we're going to have a radio remote. And next week, we'll be hearing with we're going to be hearing from Jimmy Greer and his orchestra from the 1930s from the Coconut Grove in Hollywood, California. My radio friends, my old-time radio friends, coming up in just a little while, we're going to be hearing Fibber McGee and Molly, a program in its entirety, and it's a broadcast heard originally on January 6th in 1948. Radio had two major situation comedy programs that depicted life in Midwestern small-town America. And that was Fibber McGee and Molly and Vic and Sadie. And both programs originated from Chicago in the 1930s over NBC. They were written not by a team of writers, but by gifted comedy writers, Don Quinn and Paul Reimer. The shows focused on households and small towns and, 
and recreated life in Midwestern America. The programs also accented the idiosyncrasies of odd character types. In our second half hour, we're going to hear Fibber McGee and Molly on a broadcast from January 6, 1948. Say, those of you that are old-time radio buffs, why don't you round up a paper and pencil? I'd like to hear from you. My address is Jerry Sharp at Old Time Radio, Route 1, Box 44, Mountain Iron, Minnesota, zip code 55768. I'll give that address again at the end of the program. The reason that we'd like to hear from you is to see if, if you've got something that you'd like to share with the rest of our old-time radio audience. As an example, Peter Begich of Gilbert will be our, our guest on one of our future programs, talking about when he was in a radio band that regularly appeared on KSTP radio in the Twin Cities back when they used to have live entertainment. Old-time radio was big, and chances are that there's somebody out there, one of you, one of you were, was a part of the industry and would like you to share your knowledge and experiences with us. Well, old-time radio friends, there's our theme again. And that means that in just a few minutes, uh, we're going to be listening to Fibber McGee and Molly, but first... We've got to pause for station identification, and so let's do that at this time. We'll be back with you in about a minute, right after station ID. Mm-hmm. 